When you attend the cello recital and at the end of the recital the cellist announces that he or she is gonna play as an encore piece The Swan by Saint-Saëns, usually the public goes like, oh. Well, The Swan is a very beautiful and serene piece of music composed by the French composer Camille Saint-Saëns. It is the most popular movement from a musical suite called Carnaval des Animaux. So what makes this piece so special? Well, in today's video, we are going to break down things and I will give you my insights on The Swan. So let's get started. Before we go deep into the music, well, if you're a beginner or you struggle with certain techniques in this piece, then I recommend you to watch this chapter over here. Otherwise, you can skip it. But I recommend you to stay watching because in this section, I will drop you some pro tips. So this music is not only gorgeous, but it's also very beneficial for legato, so for the control of the uh, right hand and also for the shiftings. As you will notice later on in the piece, there are some shiftings going on. So what I recommend you to do as a beginner, take the sheet music and analyze where are the shifts or the shifts that can be dangerous for you. So let's take for an example, uh, we have the first shift in the very beginning of the piece. So this one here. Mm. That one over here. So let's say that this is a danger for you, well, then you just practice it separately. You take only the F sharp and you go to the B. And you go back. And then again. So you do that a couple of times so that you get used to it, to the interval, to know where your finger has to go and when it's the right timing to do it. Then afterwards, we have another shifting. So after this, That one over here. So this you also want to practice separately. A couple of times. Fine, let's say that you did already 10 times, 20 times, I don't know how many times you need. Then you try to connect both the shiftings. Okay, of course, in my case, as I play more than 20 years of cello, this should not be a problem for me. But this will really help, so really focus where it hurts, then you start to connect them. Then you can start from the whole beginning, starting from the G. Now, how to do that shifting over here? Actually, not how, but how it would be more appropriate for this piece. So what I notice with lots of beginners is that they tend, you know, to press their finger really hard on the fingerboard and they shift very stiffly and then it becomes like this. Eh? Then we get, you know, this tensed sound, we get this ugly glissando, and it, does, it just doesn't fit with the music. Instead, you need to glide gently on the string. So on the moment you shift, release the pressure of the finger. So it's kind of like air. An air or a whistle, you can name it, but uh, it should be very gentle. What also can help is the right hand, because sometimes we can help with the right hand, our left hand. So in sense of pressure on the, on the string. So we put some volume and some tone into the F sharp, but then on the right timing, on the moment we're gonna shift, release the pressure. So you're doing kind of like a little fade out over here. That can help. So this was quickly about the shiftings. Now let's talk a little bit about the right hand. So as you notice, this is an andantino grazioso, which is not slow, but neither too fast. And it goes in six, four, right? But we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's kind of like a slow pace that we need on the bow. So here the issue could be for you, bow distribution. Many people, they start to play the piece and they tend to use too much bow on the first notes. But then when it comes near the ending, they don't have enough space. And then, yeah, of course, this will make the shift difficult and everything will just collapse. So what I recommend you to do is use your bow wisely. So don't give everything away. Yeah? And then there you are, you're struggling. Instead, distribute it nicely, so don't give too much uh, bow on the first note. Uh. And look how much bow I still have left to do the shift and to play the last note. 
because that is gonna help for the next one and so on. So think about it. Every time when you have this pattern, don't use too much bow in the beginning. Afterwards, later in the piece, the same thing. Because it's very stressful. We are dealing with thumb position over here and then many people, they get scared and then automatically they use too much bow. So now, Make sure that you know one thing is the left hand, the other thing is the right hand. Because everything has to be very smooth. Alright, with that said, now we can go deeper into the music. So what I usually like to do before even starting to play the music is to get familiar with the sheet music. I like to take a moment to look at the key signature, the time signature, the tempo, dynamics and so on, bowings, fingerings if needed. And here comes a pro tip that I really like to do before even pl playing on the cello, is to sing the melody. So you take the sheet music and you sing as beautiful as you can. Because whatever you will sing, it will come out of your mouth and then it will get back into your ear. And then that way how you sing, you want to transform mit this into your cello playing. Maybe first you will think it makes no sense. Well, I tell you, it does make sense. At the end, we have to sing when we're playing this piece. You know, there is a popular ancient Greek and Roman belief that the swan, the most beautiful of all animals, remained silent until its final moments of life, when it would sing the most beautiful of all songs. And the melody certainly captures that feeling of beauty and longing. You know, the theme in the cello starts with this three note motif, that falling three note motif, which is actually kind of like a cry. Especially that shifting over here, this should be crying, this should be not just normally played. Now, starting the G, what I often see is that people, they don't attack necessarily the note, but it's too much emphasized. No, instead you need to think like this, you know, because before, when you start to play, the piano accompaniment goes and you're out of the image, right? It's the piano that, let's say, uh, it's the streaming of the water and and you appear in the image. So you have to blend in. So don't start immediately, boom like that. No, come from far away, blend with the piano. So, so already before it's your turn to start, make sure that you're already preparing in order wow, to land nicely on it and not just starting from the string and because then it, unfortunately, it will lose its essence. About fingering here, well, most of the people, they use the fourth finger, the pinky, I use it as well. But there is an option to start with the third finger. And why is that? Because with the third finger, when you want to add vibrato over here, it gets a warmer tone. But that's up to you. With the fourth finger, you can do it as well. Maybe later on, when the recap is coming, there you can maybe use the third finger. You know this one, huh? To change the color. Besides, you can do a nice gliss. And then you get this warm tone and this warm vibrato. But anyways, going back into the beginning, so everything should be very gracefully. Then we arrive at this famous scale over here. A normal scale but it's probably one of the most beautiful scales ever written again that scale you know the climbing of it you know it should be like a graceful cry from the swan so anyways in this scale over here there are different bowings over here right you see that there are people that they separate everything I don't really agree with that so it sounds like this <laughs> Of course, when you separate everything, yes, it sounds solid and it sounds big and everything, but that's not really the point. I think, you know, again, it's about blending in. So that's why I like to slur everything. We start with two notes slurred, then four notes, and then the last two notes up. 
and you can take your time between your F sharp going into the B because we have, you know, if you look at the harmonies, we start the E. So we start something is happening, right? We're moving somewhat. And then it comes back to the G major. So that's why it's also that I need you to analyze the harmonies over here. You don't need to get, you know, really into the musical theory. I'm not so good at it. And, you know, you, you don't have to be a master in it. Just use your ears, use your instinct, listen to the recordings. You know, so that you hear what's happening in the piano or in the harps or the two pianos because originally this was written for two pianos and cello. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Do your homework and listen to the harmonies because that will help you in your performance later on. Like in the beginning again, so we start G major. So this feels like and then we have this scale. We arrive back to G major. All right, moving on. So we have the same thing in measure six. So the th same thing as the beginning, but this time we have a twist, A sharp. So compared to the first one, which was, you know, this relaxation, now we have, you know, something is happening, something tension, something tensive is coming. So it's really important that you show that A sharp, you know, take this sharp literally, sharp. So don't play it too flat because often it happens that people, they play it a little bit too flat. And then it loses something in the color. So I think it's important that you really play it sharp. Don't go, of course, too high either, but mark it because we need to have this difference between the G A natural, G A sharp, you know, something is, it feels that it's hurting. Because then afterwards we have this scale at measure eight, which starts with the F sharp. So you see, it's full of sharps. It's completely different than in measure four, which is everything very natural, very simple. No, here we have... Um so you see, it's a completely different character than in measure four. Measure four, it's a graceful cry, right? But in measure eight, it's really a cry. Also, be careful with the use of vibrato over here. I usually see people, you know, because of course it's very emotional and then, you know, their hands get very emotional. So they play... And then it gets a little bit out of control over here. No, you can help, of course, with the vibrato to create this tension, but still, you know, keep it under control. Maybe you can go a tiny little bit faster and not that relaxed as the first one. Listen to the difference. Measure four. Now we go to measure eight. So see how I open up into that B minor. I want to share something here about vibrato that don't rely too much on your vibrato when playing this piece or in general, because when we rely too much 
on vibrato, we forget everything what happens in the right hand, and then we get this kind of thing. So. Everything good and well, but there is something missing. So what I really recommend you to do is to play the whole piece without vibrato, because the right hand is our voice. This is our voice. The bow is our voice. So we need to make the most beautiful sound ever, you know, without vibrato. You know, you can do it like that. It's difficult. But it doesn't sound bad, right? It doesn't sound dead if you do it senza vibrato, without vibrato. But the thing is that when you're able to create wonderful colors without the vibrato and you depend everything on your right hand, then when you add this little touch, just a little touch, you know, it's like the cherry on top of the cake, then we're talking about magic. Because by practicing without vibrato and then when you add vibrato, you have open game, you have open cards, you can do whatever you want. You know, we can start without vibrato, you can add a little bit, maybe you can go more tensed, as I told you in measure eight. Maybe then there, again, you can wide up and then again you can close down. So you have all kinds of different vibratos, you know, at least 50 variations of vibrato in a piece of three minutes. And where we can use a different vibrato is in measure 10 and measure 12. So we start first, you know, with that painful... Right? So there we can use this one kind of vibrato. But in the second one, in the second sequence, where we have this C, you know, and it's natural, have natural, there we can use, you know, less maybe. So you see the difference first. So it's this longing. But then we are tired. Um, So do you see what I mean by using different vibratos? Because or else we get this. Uh... And then the next one. Ah, something. Something is missing, right? Anyways, here it's a tricky passage for many of you. Is that shift over here? It's something psychologically, I don't know what it is. In fact, it's not so difficult, you know, because if you practice this just as an etude... It's not so difficult. So in fact, you just need to think it's just a shift, you know, it's not the end of the world. Of course, there's an alternative fingering over here, although I never used it, but I think it can be interesting because as we're talking about crying, and, you know, with the vibrato, this can help. I go from the third finger to the third finger. And we can add, you know, this little glee sound, but not too much, because or else it becomes cheap. But it sounds a little bit like a cry, don't you think? Um, then, okay, first finger on the G, and then we can go... Uh, as it's written over here. That's an alternative. But anyways, if you're doing the usual fingering, here it's very important. Again, like I told you before, it's everything about gliding lightly on the string. Do you see? Like that, not like this. Because of course, if you're pressing, then this shift never will come through. And also another thing, if you follow my other videos, my technical videos, I always talk about left hand anticipation. So if we know that we need the pinky, after the shift, then make sure that you're anticipating him. So let me show you uh, with freestyle. So see, my pinky is already like, not squeezing, but he's getting closer. And then I shift through the string. Then it gets, you know, very, ah, it feels delicious. Because if you leave your pinky too far, then it gets jumpy and then you actually are playing with luck, you know, 50-50. Now measure 12, that's another tricky one because from measure 11... 
we need to find the C, which is sometimes very delicate. Again, this is, you know, you need to practice the F sharp. Without vibrato, practice shift without vibrato. And always with a beautiful sound. So that you remember the distance, the interval. Then afterwards, when you think, okay, I'm ready to go, then you play the F sharp, and then you stop because you have a break, and then uh, you try. So again, two, three. Also, a thing that ju I just remembered is that many people, you know, they take too much time. They dwell too much. They get, I don't know, they get blocked or something with their hands. This is what happens. So they play the F sharp. And then just before playing, then they move at last. No, make use of this little break that you have. It's in your favor. Two, three. See, so during the break, I'm already shifting and I'm anticipating my left hand. Then, uh, then it gets so much easier over here. And then it's the same principle over here. So if you're using this fingering, Make sure that with the pinky, you're ready, so you can slide through the string. Right? Cool. Now, what comes next in measure 13 and 14? This is really cool harmonically, because, you know, here we are opening... You know, this is like... You're hugging the world. This is so unexpected and it's so cool. So don't be afraid to go into that F sharp. That one. And again, wait a little bit. You don't need to go straight into tempo. F sharp. Then you relax. Then. Here, this is the best part, because again, uh, it's quite, you know, repeated, but there are little twists. So the first time we have them... So open up... Um, relax... And now... Comes the C sharp, something is happening... sharp going back into the G major and that's what I meant with the third finger instead of using the fourth finger so maybe you can try this out maybe for some of you it's better to stay with the fourth finger but I think you can create a more special a warmer tone using the third finger so anyways the difference between measure 40 and measure 16 is that we have quite innocent right if you listen and then you hug the world and remember this is like the swan opening you know it's so beautiful to see it in fact you know you as a we are thinking too much as a cellist when playing this piece but actually since sans was so perfect by writing this piece and actually many other pieces he really perfectly described this one, you know, with just notes and using the cello as an instrument, you know, because there are some arrangements for violin and other instruments, but it just doesn't sound. You know, you can put the best instrumentalist, the best musician playing it on the violin, but it never will sound as on the cello. So in that sense, you know, Camille Saint-Saëns was just perfect. Perfect. That's, that's just a perfect piece. So don't think too much, you know, like as a cellist, Look at this one, go watch some images on Google, on YouTube, whatever, and just picture yourself. When you're playing this piece, you have to see only the swan. The swan, the lake, and the flow or the stream of, of, of the water. That's all you need. No secrets. So, okay, I'm talking too much, but uh, let's go back. So measure 14 is this innocent? Because we have a C natural. But the second time in measure 16, we have now a C sharp. Something is happening. And then the F natural. And 
with the F natural. Be careful, don't start right away with the vibrato, although you can do it. <laughs> You can do that, but what I like to do is start senza vibrato and then bit by bit you open up. Check it out. Uh. So you give time to penetrate, you know, to show that, ah, that they have natural and because you can make a difference. Uh. And then you change color. And then you go back like into the beginning. Good, then we have the big, uh, like the beginning, measure 80, measure 90, it's exactly the same, but it's not exactly, exactly the same in the sense of character. Let's say in the complete beginning, we have a young swan, right? So with full of energy, you know, beautiful and so forth. But in measure 18, it's already a swan that is much older, you know, it's his last moments of life. So it's already the old one, so here we have to play with wisdom over here. So it's not just, you know, no, here, very like this. Then the next scale also is going to be different because even, you know, we're opening up, but this his last cry, you know, it's his last time that he wants to try to open up. But then he gets tired. So let me play this section for you. So it's here where he wants to try one more time. Getting tired. He sang goodbye. I like to stay on the D string because it's more mellow. And then the piano. And then you're out. So, going into this measures, uh, 20, 21, so this long beam, this is a dangerous one because of the, of, because it's very long, it's six quarter notes. One, two, three, one, two, three. But help here with your vibrato, here you can go nuts. Um, make sure that I don't hear the transition of the bow, so. Now try to really blend them. You need to imagine that you're playing in one bow. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ooh, this is difficult. But anyway, gladly we can, you know, do it like that. But then make sure you're imagining two, three, one, two, three. And then here, whoa, this happens. Eh? I move. Don't stay stuck. Only from here. And then, okay, we're arriving in measure 24. Here, we have many options. We can go on the A string, but I like to stay on the D string. Because it's easier to have this mellow tone, you know, and this tone of saying goodbye. And automatically our vibrato change. Then I like to do second, three, one, and then I just move to one. And from here, be careful, thump. I don't do harmonic. I press a little bit and I pretend to do a vibrato so it doesn't sound empty. But I mean, you don't need to do that, but it sounds really beautiful if you are able to do that. Another option is like this. Anyway, there you can take a break if you want. Right? And during the break, two, three. There you move your hands. Easy going. And then, then you, 
can finish like this as well. And the last step for today is work on phrases. So what I gave you before this pro tip of singing the melody, you know, as more as beautiful as you can, listening to recordings, don't get stuck, you know, so one, two, three, four, five, six, don't think per note, think per measure. And here you come to and we have the skill so you see I'm not thinking about per note per quarter note or per eighth note no I'm thinking about you know the bigger picture per measure well, I really hope that you enjoyed this breakdown. Thank you so much for watching. For me, this was a huge pleasure to do it. Last week, I have posted the Saint-Saëns, the Swan, me playing it. So you can check this video right here. It's gonna appear right here, or you can find it in the video description below. Please let me know which piece I should cover next. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. That's the biggest support you can give to me. Thank you so much again, and I'll see you in the next video.